So the rendering I took is from this view. Uh, but basically, we're going to set up a new one. Um, or we can do the same image over again. And I have some layers I want to talk about as well. But uh, I'll wait for you to download and open the file for now. Parallel projection. So when you click on a viewport, right click to this viewport, you got set view, isometric, northeast. This gives you a parallel projected drawing. And I also have some display options here like wireframe shaded rendered and they all represent the physical I mean the digital geometry in a different way right so wireframe shows me all the outlines uh, it's actually similar to x-ray where it partially shows the surfaces and partially shows the edges uh, rendered view actually doesn't show the outlines it just shows the surfaces uh, under some default sunlight setting uh, there are also some custom viewports like artistic, pen, uh, ghosted. So ghosted is like a hybrid of wireframe and rendered, where rendering is kind of in transparency, right? So we're going to look at these display modes a little bit. Um, and the other thing is we also have, uh, if you go to viewport properties, when you set up an isometric drawing, the projection mode is in parallel projection, right? So what does that mean? That means that um, all the geometry lines are projected onto a plane. All the lines, all the projected lines are parallel to each other. Uh, but if we switch it to perspective, then basically we're going to have a location for our camera and then everything will be projected to the to that point of where we are looking at the model right so that's how we're going to get perspectival projection so this will be basically how somebody would see the project in first person view right now one difference between this one and the two point perspective is that the single point perspective also has a vertical vanishing point so if you look at for instance this view this line here is not parallel to the vertical um, vertical plane, right? So the, the building is also vanishing as it goes up. So the two-point perspective actually fixes that. So if you go back to your viewport properties and switch to two-point perspective, hit OK. What it does it is it still gives you a sense of the perspective, but it fixes all the vertical elements to be parallel as well. So it's kind of in between parallel projection it takes parallel projection for vertical, but keeps perspectival for the horizontal elements. So this is kind of the the setting we are going to use to place our camera and the first person to capture the project. Okay. So the the other thing is the lens length. Uh, so if you go to viewport properties again, we have a lens length here, and lens length kind of. Uh, uh, it, it affects basically how far the clipping plane for the view is away from uh, the location of the eye, right? So if I make it uh, longer, then basically I'm going to like uh, I'm going to clip out the image as much. But if I change it to be smaller. I'm going to basically uh, have more projected geometry onto the clipping plane because it's going to be closer to the eye. Closer to the eye. Huh? Yeah, it gets closer. So you capture more, basically. So this is how uh, you would also do the fisheye view. If, if you got, Have you guys like seen fisheye? Right, so if I switch to perspective... Right, if I do it 5... It's kind of like a fisheye view where you you get a lot of the uh, a lot of the globe. So the clipping the, the the clipping plane is actually really close to the eye. So that's why you can actually capture a lot more of the geometry. Uh, it only allows you to do the depth because that's the only thing you need to control, right? So basically, we have. So I'm going to uh, switch to. I'm going to go to perspective tab 
right click to the perspective viewport properties okay any view so let's say I want to take the image from here which kind of captures the building I'm gonna come down here and then convert go to the perspective viewport properties do two-point perspective and choose the last thing to be 25 25 for starters so you get kind of not 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 yet so just do a two-point perspective 25 and then the camera Z value I want it to be I height right what is I height like six feet so I'm gonna enter six and hit OK and it will place the camera at an eye height and it will uh, have two point perspective it didn't work so basically right click viewport properties enter 6 here if I want to put it at 15 I'll put 15 then do place uh, just right click to confirm these values this, these are XYZ values of the camera just right click to confirm and then hit OK. It will adjust the viewport uh, according to that, right? And then if I if I do panning, I'm basically moving my camera still. So you may change the height. Wait, huh? Uh, zooming in, I would do it with holding Alt and right click. So you can do it like you can zoom in and zoom out if you want to distance yourself a bit more from the project this is more like finding an angle that you like and kind of a view angle that you like then you can right click again here and convert the Z value for the camera right so the Z value for the camera you can always come back here and enter 6 confirm and hit OK so you can adjust the camera to the eye height all the time right no okay uh, like I, I have some geometry here as well so I'm kind of resting on a ground um, so all I'm going to do is you can also do this you can select the side objects and then just do a horizontal scale so I'm gonna stretch them kind of extend them towards here actually yeah let's do it let's do it I'm just extending the site I think you will eventually have a topo like where you place your camera you will be on on the topo so you would have a geometry already under your eye but in my case my topo is kind of uh, extended right I mean um, it's kind of exhausted here so I need to extend the site the road the building so that I get geometry in my view uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the buildings and I'm going to stretch them uh, you don't ha you don't have to do it. I'm I'm just doing it uh, to kind of to kind of get my view something like this. You see, so it's kind of I'm I'm resting on a geometry. Does that make sense? So I'm I'm on the road looking at the building basically. So it would be something similar if I extended this uh, landscape. basically something like this now I want to store this angle so how do I do storing right click to the image tab set view named views so I'm going to save this one and call it uh, perspective one so that will be available to me all the time so even if I mess up my uh, camera angle I can always go back to this view right so I could do my modeling do my adjustments and if I want to go back to that view I do set view perspective one and it will take me to that viewport so I can export multiple images from that view okay I did the sure right click to the image tab go to set view named views and save as give it a name so it stores it as a viewport
this is where uh, it takes me. So you can access it through this viewport. Right click here, go to display options or go to tools, um, options. And under options, you can go to view display modes. Right, so the display modes, th these are the display modes that are available to me uh, by default in, in Rhino. So uh, if you Google display modes for Rhino, uh, like additional display modes for Rhino, advanced Rhino 5 display modes, so these are some custom display modes that are generated uh, by um, MacNeil. And you can also download these. So th these are already given. The technical, the pen, artistic, rendered, they are already available as settings here. But you can also download new ones. So if you go all the way down, there is a patent version. So it's something that does uh, shading with these diagonal lines as well as uh, different line weights. There's a blueprint one. Uh, blackboard, simple bright, ghosted blueprint. So there are different types of display modes basically. And you can create your own custom display modes as well. So these are simultaneous um, images that are, the, this is the way geometry is displayed in Rhino basically. So they are not renderings. And you can also capture them. So I'm just going to show you one. Uh, for instance, go to Patent Ini, this, uh, the top one. Click on it to download it. So it tells you what it does. This mode is quite sensitive to shadow settings. Some options to experiment with this is in this mode. Shadow line angle. Try different angles it says. So basically download the file. Open it to your desktop. Extract it to your desktop. It's this dot uh, INI configuration settings file. Uh, you could also try importing the other one. So I'll also import uh, the blueprint. I'll download that one and open up it open it up as well. Okay. So if you want to use them, you can go to tools, options, display modes. So you can click import here and find that file. So I'm going to import the blueprint. I go to blueprint, hit open. And Blueprint will be added to my display mode options. Huh? Yes, you have to have the .ini file, the .ini file. So go to Tools Options. Within this display modes bar, you see these are all the display modes that are available. I clicked on Import, and I chose the Blueprint. I want to import the Blueprint as a display mode setting. I could do the same thing for patent. So it will be added under my display modes. So the the reason why I'm importing them is because they already have some predefined settings. And if you want to see your building within those settings, you can just right click to your viewport and you can now see the, those custom viewports, uh, the display modes here. So blueprint is added. So if I click to blueprint, it will show the geometry using blueprint settings. Right, so everything now has white lines and uh, different line ways basically okay so this one is patent drawing huh yeah <laughs> go to the view angle you set up right click to the viewport set view perspective one so this is the angle that I want to capture the project. If I want to use this display mode and I want to capture this view that I'm seeing, I'm going to hit dash view capture to file. The second option. It's uh, you find it in the autocorrect. View capture to file. And the the initial dash gives you the option to select a file name. So you can do browse, select desktop give it a file name. Uh, this one was I think uh, patent drawing so I'm going to say patent uh, if you choose PNG you you can enable transparent background so basically if you don't have anything in the background there won't be any 
uh, pixel value there so it will be transparent when we import it in uh, Photoshop I'm gonna hit save and then in this view tab it's gonna ask us for resolution right now my screen display resolution is 996 by 719 so it's basically the amount of pixels that are used within this viewport right so if I wanna bump it up I wanna get a higher quality image I need to click and edit these height and width uh, pixel values so I'm going to make my width in 6000 and height in 6000 as well so it's going to be a square image and my transparent background is yes I'm gonna hit enter yeah I saved as a PNG uh, let me see what PNG does if, if it doesn't work with this view setting it basically gave me an image like this I'll do it again so let's do it for another view view mode so I'm going to go to rendered view right click and change to rendered display mode rendered if I want to capture this image capture whatever I'm seeing in my display okay enter dash view capture to file browse image I want to save file type as PNG and transparent background I'm gonna hit save and my current resolution overrides are already stored so I, I'm going to ex export a 6000 by 6000 image and I just hit enter to that and that's how long it takes to basically for Rhino to get the actual screen resolution and then enhance it to be whatever I want it to be right and it gives me an image so the image I got looks like this it's a 6000 by 6000 image okay did it work it looks okay if you go to let's say uh, this is rendered view okay uh, by the way there are some lines here so I want you to turn them off uh, go to lines layer and hit this light bulb uh, sorry go to lines layer and hit this light bulb so you turn off the lines so this is all solid geometry in Rhino no materials no differentiation it's just solid geometry okay so now I'm going to work on display modes I just turned off the line layer lines layer so go to the viewport settings again tools options display modes let's create our own display mode okay I'm gonna start with the rendered view mode this is the rendered view mode I'm gonna choose the rendered and I'm gonna hit copy and it's going to create a copy of rendered and it's going to give me the same settings that are used to generate that drawing now we can make our own variations of it so the copy of rendered I'm going to call it uh, rename it clay shades okay I'm gonna hit OK to that now if you right click to your viewport clay shades will be added as a new display mode clay shades you got it now right click to the viewport do display options it will take you the same view tab it's you can either ac access it from display options here or go to tools options under view you will have your display modes here so clay shades is added if you hit this plus sign again you will see all the different display modes in Rhino if you think there is too much clutter you can also delete them you can only leave one or two it's really up to you 
It's, it's just these are all the ways we can represent or display the geometry. Right? So I'm going to go to clay shades. Now let's look at what's happening there. I'm going to hit this plus sign as well. So this display mode basically has uh, multiple options to represent geometry. Right? So there are basic options here inside this uh, main tab and then there are also additional options for objects, for shadows and for other types of settings as well. So the first thing I'm going to do, I want to add highlights to geometry. So to add highlights to the geometry, I'm going to go to the main tab of the display mode and then I'm going to choose, uh, I'm going to increase edge thickness I'm going to enter 2 and see what happens immediately in display mode. So I'm basically adding line weights to actual geometry in my uh, display mode. Right? So this controls the line weight. So it was set to be 0, so basically no lines. Uh, 1 is too thin. I'm going to leave it at 2. So basically, geometries will be highlighted with lines. Did everybody get it? I'm going to hit OK. Huh? Sure, I'll do it again. Display options. Display modes. I went to clay shades. And under this, these options, there's surface edge settings. I increased edge thickness to 2 pixels. I, I mean, whatever you renamed it. I made a copy of the rendered view in display mode. You can go to the rendered view and enter an edge thickness there as well if you want. Doesn't work? Let me go over actually how they're displayed. If you again go to your display options. I made a copy of the uh, rendering view mode here, right? So. I have another toolbar here that says shadows. If you go to shadows, the rendered view has shadows on. Right? Like for instance, this one will be turned off in wireframe mode or shaded mode that actually don't display shadows, don't cast uh, light rays onto your model. So what I want you to do here is bump up some of the settings. I want you to bump up the sharper shadows so this goes all the way to the max. Um, you want the soft edge quality to be up. Uh, you want uh, edge blurring to be off, uh, camera base clipping plane to be off, and the rest of it should be fine. So when you bump these up, you will see crisper shadows. So it, it will be basically similar to the shadows you extracted for your ISO drawings. Okay? That's all the settings you need to do here. And then when you go to clay shades, uh, make sure that we are using uh, scene lighting here. So the scene lighting being the light source that we added in uh, in Rhino, right? We added a single directional light and we were controlling how shadows were affected by it, right? I cannot see them in my file, but you'll be able to see in yours. So if you rotate that, uh, that light source, you'll be able to adjust the shadows as well, right? So make sure that the lighting scheme is scene lighting. It's right under the uh, edge thicknesses that we added. All right, so this is, uh, this is one of the... Uh, this is one of the settings. So I'm going to actually send you these files. Uh, I'm going to send you two files, one for the shading and one for the shadows. And um, I'm actually going to upload what those files look like as JPEGs. And then I'm going to open Photoshop and show you the steps in Photoshop. Um, but before I do that, I also want to show you some other things. So when we switch to this view mode, um, look at what happens here. These objects are highlighted with black lines. This guy is highlighted with white lines. So if you select that object, 
and go to its properties this is located in the, under layer one and if you look at layer one layer one has uh, display color as white you guys see this 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 is white. if you make it red that line will turn into red right so this is basically uh, the highlight of these geometries are affected or overwritten by the layers they're located at and you can control the lines the line colors using these options here yeah Sandy do you have a question uh, um, I can make the walls that are facing this way right let's say this guy maybe this guy this guy and this guy I'm going to actually select these elements and I'm going to go to their properties I'm going to put them into layer one layer one and they will take the same layer property right so the, right now they're taking that edge color as red which is the layer edge color I just selected uh, I just selected these elements Ho I'm holding shift to select them to add them to my selection and then went to their properties and changed their layer to be layer one which has uh, stroke values at red now the other thing I want to do is go to layers again I want the objects in this layer to be black okay so I can select the objects in that layer using the layer so I right click to the layer choose select objects uh, I also got the roads I'm going to deselect the roads or you can actually let's include the roads as well doesn't matter so I got all the objects in that layer I go to properties go to material make sure the material is assigned by layer go to the material tab material tab is located next to the object properties tab material tab make sure to switch it to layer <laughs> Re Rebecca is going to murder me by <laughs> So what happened? Yeah. I'm going to uh, turn everything off. Uh, delete the lines layer. Delete the lines layer. Delete layer and delete the objects in it so you get something like this uh, what I did was I went to layer 1 turned this to be white right so what I'm doing is I'm specify I've already specified some material here associated to the layer how do I do that I right click to the layer set properties material and here I have just chosen black as a color so what that does is it gives everything that is in this layer a black material as surface uh, shading option right if I change this to be let's say um, cyan it's basically going to override the surface uh, display of those elements in that layer so I'm going to leave that to be black again or you can also test other options like dark gray but leave it at black now what I want to do is add uh, horizontal lines to these elements and I'm going to do it using a simple command I'm going to create a new layer I'm going to call it uh, you can call it lines or contours or let's call it texture I'm going to switch to that layer make sure the layer stroke option is set to white okay and make sure that layer is active now the command is called contour so I'm going to type in contour contour hit enter I'm gonna choose this wall just this wall in the middle 
just this wall in the middle it says select objects for contours just this guy right click now it says contour base uh, plane base point just select the bottom corner of the point uh, of the geometry it says direction you could select the top corner or you could enter 0, 0, 001 for z plus z direction right so we're going to contour it horizontally and it says distance between contours uh, let's say 0.2 and hit enter It's like fire. <laughs> I did. I did it in the wrong direction, though. I'll, I'll fix mine. I did it in the wrong direction, so I'm gonna do it in the side view. Let's do it in the side view. Go to the side view. Type in contour again. Contour. And choose this corner and go all the way up like I'm just in I'm just creating a line basically I'm just drawing a vertical line I want the contours to be going in that direction and then distance is point two so it will give horizontal uh, it will divide uh, it will intersect the geometry with a plane at that interval and mine is actually a bit dense so I'm gonna undo this again do one more time choose that wall go up and I'm gonna hit one so that I get uh, just these parallel lines right so I get something like this now I could do this for other ones as well so maybe this guy and this guy has it vertical so I could select those come to the elevation again do contour and this time I want my contours to go from right to left right so I can just draw a line that is horizontal and hit the same value so it's gonna contour them in that direction right so I get something like that I could do the same for this one but I need to do it in plan view so that the contours go along the geometry right so what contour does we're just stylizing them huh did it work it goes diagonal yes because because of the line direction right you you want the line direction to be kind of following the geometry so for instance for instance if I do it this way I choose this guy and I want to contour it this way right so I draw a line and do contour it that way and I could do the same here this way it's the interval it's the interval so if I do contour choose the geometry choose the line and then distance between contours if I do point two it's gonna be a lot denser right the interval is uh, really small so I get different actually varying it makes it really nice right because you can then recognize individual surfaces as well Okay, so I, now I have something like this with my custom viewport setting. So I have these elements that are shaded as black and highlighted with white. And I also added a new layer called texture with some parallel lines for shading. So think of them as like brick walls or uh, wood walls. Maybe those are some elements that you want to highlight. Um, I also have model some glass I'll just show you how to add glass really quickly it's it's re going to be really simple um, I already created a layer here called glass and there are probably some elements already inside of it 
if you turn off everything and just isolate glass, you will see the glass elements in the model. And uh, uh, you were just asking, like, extrusion-wise, I just extruded sin single lines to create glasses because glass doesn't have thickness, right? You don't need to model a box. So basically, if you know where the glass is, you can just draw a line and then extrude the line as a single surface up to a certain height. And that will be a glass plane, basically, right? Now, um, what I did was I went to this layer, right-click to the layer, and again, go to Set Properties Material. All I did was I chose a white material for glass, and I added uh, some transparency for the material so that it appears to be glass, right? So you can make this uh, you can make this even a bit large, uh, a bit more. So you can enter seventy percent transparency, and you can see the preview here. Basically, it's a transparent material. Now this will be associated to this layer as a material. So everything that you want to be using that property, you can put it in that layer, right? So all these glass planes that I have, I can choose them. Go to the properties tab switch their layer to be glass and then make sure the material is assigned by layer again so if i choose assigned by layer they will be transparent and i'm going to bring everything back so now you will see these guys are actually transparent you can see the spaces inside and I also added some mullions. Mullions are basically simple box extrusions, box profiles. You could also do mullions um, by using the shell command if you want. So, for instance, if you know a specific, if you have a specific dimension uh, for the glasses, so let's say I'll just small one here, eight feet by four feet. So this is, let's say, going to be a window, right? It's something like this. So I'm, if I want to turn this into a mullion, I could use the shell command and enter a thickness, let's say two inches for the shell. And I can choose the front and the back face, and it will give me a mullion. And I can model a single glass plane in the middle of it and make copies of this as my glasses, like windows, basically, right? I can just make an array of it. So I could basically do a single line here in the middle. I'm actually going to go to another view, like perspective view. So I could just model a single line to the midpoint. And I'm going to extrude this. Now this guy is going to be in glass layer and this guy is going to be in mullions. So right now basically it's a solid mullion panel and there's transparent glass in it and I can just use it as much as I want, right? So I can just make copies of it. And I can make rows of windows. It's really simple. Just keep it simple. Yeah. Sure. No, no, no problem. So um, let's create it from scratch. I'm going to create it. Glass two. Bla blank layer. Blank layer. Right click. Set properties. Material. And under default material, just I I chose color. Transparency. Just make it transparent. So just make it uh, like seventy percent. So you can look at the property here, like a preview on left top. You can see that it's transparent. I mean, for modeling purposes, I could make it in color if I want, right? So that now any object that I'm, I can put in this layer, like let's say these glass planes, if I put them to that layer, they're transparent glass, right? And that layer is taking cyan, 
with 70% transparency. Uh, yeah, I still do have the same viewport. Okay, did everybody get something like, did, did we get an understanding of how to use layers, materials, lines, display modes? You kind of getting a sense of it? Yeah. And download these two files. Uh, one is shades, one is shadows. So I'm going to upload two display mode settings. Uh, for you to generate those. One is going to be called shadows, one is going to be called shades. Um, but all this layering, basic material properties, you could set it up on your own, right? So you could add different types of, um, like contouring, different types of uh, transparency, uh, windows, mullions, you can set it up all in your model, basically. Um, like this one, for instance, the roads could be another shade of gray, right? It could be a darker shade of gray. It doesn't have to be black. So we can separate, we can create some multiple shades. Now, the files you're going to get, uh, they look like this. So basically, it's uh, two different renderings using two different display modes in Rhino. So I'm going to create a new folder here. So they are saved as PNG. So basically all you will have to do is choose that viewport that we just stored, right? So something like this for instance. And then assign your display mode setting, clay shades for instance, for one. Export it as a um, view capture as a high resolution image and then change it to a second display mode that I'm going to sh share with you. It's called shadows and then save it as another file and you will get two renderings basically, right? And they're going to look like this. So this is going to be the shades and this is going to be the shadows. So the difference is the shades will have some line properties, some highlights, uh, some colors, some material options, transparency, but the shadows will just be a solid model that has uh, shadows on it. So it's basically showing geometry and light relationship, right? And we're going to overlap them in uh, Photoshop to enhance the image. So that's what, I, that's what we are going to do now. Huh? So open a new file and create 23 by 11. Uh, let's make resolution 150. So we get an open canvas, basically. This is kind of the landscape format we've been using for our renderings. And what I want you to do is select the two images and bring them in to Photoshop. And these by default fit to the image because I exported them from the rendering I already had. Uh, but if they are different sizes, because like when you export 6,000 by 6,000, you're going to get a square image, right? So you need to align it, position it, scale it up so that you fit to the artboard. Yeah. Huh? Would you say the width height You mean from Rhino? No. No, oh, uh, 11 by 23 and 150 DPI. Now, when you click and drop an image, um, you get this uh, smart object option. And what I want you to do is select both of them separately and rasterize them so that you convert them into pixels. So right click to these layers and rasterize them. So 
So these are basically the two layers I have. I have shadows on one layer and I have shades on another layer. So shades also have uh, material properties, right? Uh, if we just use the shadow layer with some transparency, it's still going to block some of the uh, elements with the shades, right? So because this only has the a single um, single shading for all the geometry and shadow, so it's almost like a flat black and white image, right? If I just apply some transparency to this, it's still going to filter out some of the materials that I'm applying underneath or the line weights, so it's going to not work properly. So instead, what, what we're going to do is choose the shadows, not as a normal layer, but apply a filter to it. So if you come up to this drop box, I want you to choose overlay. And what overlay does is it looks at the overlap of each pixel with the underlying layers and it enhances them. So basically, it's, this layer is going to use the black and white information to darken whatever is underneath it, right? So it's going to almost like trans translate the shadows it has to the underlying image, okay? So I'm going to choose shadows and then use overlay. And it's going to give you something like this. So it's going to bring the layer underneath uh, to the front and it's going to apply shadows on top of it, right? So this is how it looks without the shadows, the underlying image, and this is what it looks with an overlaid shadow image. So it basically adds that depth we, we wanted to add. Now the next thing I want to do is uh, kind of play around with the black and white balance of the image, right? Uh, if you remember, we did it by using the curves. Last time we did Photoshop, you guys remember? We brought up curves. So if you go to Image, Adjustments, Curves, shortcut is Control M. Hmm? I switched the shades because I'm using shadows only to enhance the underlying image. So now I want to lighten up the image below. So I go to image, adjustments, curves, and I sh selected the shades layer. Is it locked? Did you rasterize it? Control M. Control M is the shortcut for curves. So this guy is going to be overlay. And this guy is, we're going to switch the curves. And then I want to play around with it a bit to see if we can lighten the image up without losing the shadows as much, right? Because I don't want to do something that is like. Um, that is too bright, where I'm losing the geometry outline, but I'm, I'm doing it kind of like a soft edit, kind of see if I can balance the, th this is basically the, uh, the pixel information for the overall image, and the curves are making an adjustment, kind of filtering out some of the values. Okay, see what looks best. I'm gonna hit okay. Now the next thing is I want to bring in other layers to this image, like people, trees, um, maybe a background, right? So uh, where can we find cutout images? So go onto the web, type in cutout people. Um, this is a good website, Skalgabar, and the other one is Immediate Entourage. I'm going to send out these links, but basically they offer free cutout. Uh, images that you could use and a lot of architecture students actually use these websites as well so you can find uh, trees here you can find people to put onto your renderings images um, so what what I want you to do is what the image I showed you this one it has a figure that is closer to our view and figures behind right and I don't I'm not actually putting too much too many people I'm not doing too much cluttering like uh, that's kind of also 
the balance of these images. Like when I showed you Monsia Tinon renderings, they only have a few people to kind of give the sense of the depth, the perspective. So you should just find a few that you like and that can complement the view and just use those. So I kind of found uh, like a peop like two people having a picnic, maybe it's kind of a um, park. You want to give that sense of like somebody's having a picnic there so you can use those. If you have like a element that cantilevers, maybe some people are looking below it, like something that complements that geometry. And I put some like nicer figure closer to my view. And make sure that this is actually high resolution so that when it's printed, it's not blurry, okay? And same thing goes with the trees as well. And I'm gonna show you how, um, how to use both of them. So go online and download some of these peep, uh, pictures so you could just, um, you could give it a shot. And the other thing to consider in these images, you don't want to put somebody with a bikini and somebody with a coat, right, on the same image. You need to put people that are dressed up according to the same climate, maybe similar type of people, similar type of environment. Yeah. Uh, they, they're normally good resolution. So you will you will understand when you drag and drop them onto your canvas. If they are large in size, they already they already fit to the resolution you want. So you can't judge if it's the So let's see if um, like I had these. So I had this guy. I had this guy, and these are always in PNG, which is nice because it's already cut. The silhouette is already cut out. So what I'm doing is uh, open up the image that you want you're working on so mine is here select the file I want to bring in this figure I click and drag it onto the canvas and it, it's already large in size with respect to the full resolution I have I'm going to shrink shrink this down anyway so it it, it will basically work still okay and right now I'm, I'm not sure if you guys are seeing this but I'm I'm getting kind of a weird display is because it's under the shadow layer that is used as an overlay, right? So this has to be all the way above these two layers. And I'm going to place it somewhere. So basically, if I'm six feet high and looking at the building and this guy is close to me, I'm probably going to crop out some parts of it, right? So maybe he's going to be, I'm going to be seeing him like this, right? Because he's close to me. If he was further away, I would use the transform tool and then take him back. Okay. So bring in some images, find some. Um, um, these have to be grayscale images. So go ahead and go to image mode grayscale option because we are working with grayscale prints so go to image mode grayscale to convert this into a grayscale image and then choose don't flatten and um, uh, rasterize yes and discard yeah it will just turn into black and white let, let me drop another one so I'll bring in these two, it will be automatically grayscaled. Black background? So here's another thing. Uh, let's bring in a tree. So same thing. Go to, you can go to immediate entourage. Uh, free cutout plans, browse all. So we are going to um, use trees as just black. They're not going. We're not going to use the leaves, or you, we're not going to use the colors of them or the textures of them. So make sure you find cutout trees. Uh, actually, there aren't too many here. Make sure make sure you find cutout ones that are more hollow. So I I actually like this one. I use this guy, um, which has all this transparency information in it. Well, 
sure, but again, again, um, look. This is kind of the image we're trying to get at, right? So you, you want to use it as something that like filters as well, like something that shows information behind as much as possible. Um, maybe we have more here, categories. Um, plants. These are all people, I think. If you look up cutout trees, uh, this one I think sells them. Uh, this is another website, I guess. Let me see if we can download these. Oh, there are a lot more here. And these are a lot better as well. So you could also use mrcutout.com. I'm going to send you these links, mrcutout.com, Skalgabar, and uh, Immediate Entourage. Uh, but there are more trees here, which, which are actually stylistically better as well. So I'm going to download some of them. Uh, maybe this guy here. Uh, I guess you have to register for this one. But it probably doesn't cost anything, so... Um, use this this file instead so immediate entourage use this guy or uh, download any other one that you like over there and we can we can see how it looks you can also use the, these like thinner elements yeah huh? yeah so I'm going to save this image as a PNG as my tree then when I'm using it this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to open Photoshop again. So if you guys look here, there isn't much detail here, right? So it's like a nice spot to put place a tree, basically. So we need to cover this area a bit. So I'm going to bring in my tree. It will immediately be converted to black and white. Now, everything that we are doing is uh, shaded. And this guy has a lot of texture going on, so what we want to do is um, stylistically flatten it out a bit. Kind of similar to this effect that we, we are seeing in these renderings that I just showed you. So to do that, I'm going to, after I bring the tree, I'm going to right click to its layer, rasterize it first, and then right click to it again, go to blending options. Okay. So bring in the tree, right click rasterize, and then right click, go to blending options. Uh, the tree is, uh, download some from immediate entourage. So there's uh, also a category called uh, plants. No, it's, it's, it's basically when we drop it in, it brings it as a smart object. So it will only allow you to stretch it, scale it up and down, but it won't allow you to override its pixels or change its information. So you have to rasterize it first. Okay. Uh, right click to the tree layer, go to blending options, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to color overlay, color overlay, and I'm going to make it black and hit OK. Huh? Right click, blending options, color overlay, click here, select black. This is the color of the overlay. So I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is basically I'm telling Photoshop to convert all the pixels of this image to be black. I could also make it red if I want, but our image is in grayscale, so it's going to be black. Huh? Now, how do we add shadows for a tree? Any ideas? Because this tree has to cast shadows as well, right? Huh? 
brush. Well, good luck. <laughs> huh? Just, just add a few brushes. <laughs> so there's a simpler way. There's a simpler way. And it, it requires a little bit of skill, but I'll just show you how to add it. Look at the way the shadows are cast in my file. The shadows are coming in this direction, right? So the tree needs to have some shadows right here below. And it, we can use the same image to assign like shadows, basically. So all I have to do is choose the layer, right click to it, and duplicate layer. Huh? And distort it, yeah. Right click, blending options, color overlay, click here and select black. Okay, that's the color. Now the copy of it, I need to distort. So we're going to do distort. Go to edit, transform, and choose distort. Huh? The shadow or the, the color overlay? I haven't done it yet, the shadow. So I made a copy of it. Right click, duplicate layer. You could also literally uh, choose the layer, hold Alt on your keyboard, click and drag, right? That's how we did the copying, if you guys remember that. It's the same thing. And then the second guy needs to be under the top one because that's going to be the shadow, right? So this is the layer order. The tree is going to be the top layer and the layer be below it needs to be the shadow. And that one is the one we are going to distort. So when that's selected, I go to Edit, Transform, Distort. And look at how I'm doing it. So these are the control controls for distort, right? So this is basically how I can distort an image. So there are eight control points. So I click on this one, I bring it to the ground, and if I want, I can also squeeze it a bit here, squeeze it a bit there, because don't forget, this is in perspective. So the tree shadow has to vanish a bit from our view, away, right? So that's kind of closer to being the shadow of the tree. Huh? Um, that would be nice, yeah. You can do it the same way. So now this tree is located exactly under this guy, but it has to have some transparency, right? Because it's still black filled. So I'm going to choose this guy and give it some transparency, like 50%. So it will give the sense of the shadow. Huh? You can do that too. It's, it's totally up to you. It's all fine. Now, he, here, guys, guys, here, here is a strategic thing. Look at how I placed the tree, right? If that shadow was overlapping with the building, it has to fold, right? It has to distort because there's a vertical plane there. So where I stop is basically a flat plane. So you have to be really conscious of where you're positioning these elements and how you're casting their shadow. Right there, right now. So what do I do? The, the shadow? Um, well, you can select these two and move them together anywhere you want. So you can distance it a bit more away from the building. Huh? Well, this won't be realistic, would it? So then I, you have to distance it a bit so that you cast the shadow perfectly onto a flat plane. Or you distort it such that the shadow is still off that vertical surface. You don't want to have the shadow cast on two surfaces that are like at different because then you have to break the shadow and fold it as well. Well, it's a lot of work. So let's find. I think I shared this on T Square. I, I shared like a grass texture, didn't I? Huh? So grab that texture. Grab that texture. I have this one. Um, I wish I renamed these. But it, to, to be honest, you could use any of these again. 
if you have gravel on the ground, it will be great if you, like, I'm, I'm just going to show you how to do the grass, but it's exactly the same process. It's just, you're going to multiply the maps and then distort them the same way so that they complement the perspective you're in. Yeah, yeah, the same way, the same way. Um, so I'll just use this one. So I'm going to, watch me how to do it. So this is the texture. When I bring it here, it's going to be already in grayscale. I'm going to do Control T. Let's say this is the actual dimension of my texture. How do I multiply them? I use the Alt key, make copies, right? And then Control E to merge. Alt, make copy, Control E to merge. That's what you did for the texture assignment. Does everybody remember that? Okay. I can keep doing this, right? Until I get the the right size of the texture I want to use. Now, let's think of where the grass is. Let's say the grass is exactly within the property. Or um, let's say it's outside the property line. Let's say this, this white plane is all supposed to be grass. Okay? I'm going to first scale this up. to be as large as possible and then give it some transparency let's say 50 percent and then I'm gonna go to edit transform perspective you can also use distort but perspective would be easier and then if you click on any of these corners it's going to distort the texture to fit within the perspective, right? So I'm doing it until I basically line up the left side and I line up the right side. So I'm going to enlarge it here. Let me see. Well, this has to Let's see. Before doing the perspective, let me do the let me do this scale again. History free transform. Before we do this one, let's do edit transform. Let's try with distort. Actually, it's a lot easier with distort just do it with distort so I'm basically adjusting the left side and I'm adjusting the right side so this guy comes in here and this guy goes out here it doesn't have to be a perfect fit but you guys see I'm like lining it up here to cover this line and I'm doing the same thing on the other side so I'm basically moving in this control point to line it up on the right side and this one would line up as well so this could go here and this goes here so that's basically the distorted texture that I'm going to use on the ground right this is this is the guy I did distort and I chose the four corner points and I adjusted them to fit to these lines to fit to the huh? no you cannot add more points but what we could do is we could subtract this area out of it so that's what we are going to do next so my texture right now is occupying a lot more area so I'm considering like this area to be the texture right so this part is going to be taken out so what I need to do is give your layer a bit more opacity so like 20 let's say 40 percent opacity so you can see the layer now choose the third option choose the polygonal lasso tool polygonal lasso tool and what you want to do is select the area you want to trim out. 
So I'm going to start from this edge and then go all the way here. This is the other line. And then come down here and then go up. So I'm making a selection where I will d delete the texture, right? So this part of the texture I don't need because I'm just doing it for this, the, the part that is around my site, okay? And then once I grab that selection with the polygonal lasso tool, polygonal lasso tool is basically inputting control points and then getting a polyline. You can just delete these pixels. And then this guy is basically trimmed right. And we can bump its transparency back to 100%. And now I have to locate it behind the layers, right? So the tree has to be above this. This guy has to be above it. So this guy needs to go basically below all of those and above my rendering so that it covers that area like a carpet. Okay? Does that make sense? All right? So you can add textures like this to the ground. Um, and sky is a lot easier. So you, you could just... Um, we could just find a sky image like a background. So you want to find something that can that you can use and something that complements the view angle that you have. Um, so I'll probably like help you choose these next week. Um, but basically, uh, it shouldn't have any book. Um, what do you call these bookmarks? No, the uh, these marks or letters on them. Uh, let's find the landscape. So let's say we use. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna try to use this one. I just found an image, and I'm going to bring it in Photoshop. grass, trees with sky. So this is my background. I'm going to scale it up to fit to the image. And then this has to be all the way behind my renderings, right? So it goes all the way below. And then what I could do is position it in such a way that it's behind and add some transparency. So make it like light. <coughs> 